In this presentation, we will take a look at a few items in Luke chapter 22 and John chapter 18. Again, I'd encourage you to read those so that you're familiar with the storyline and what's happening. I think you'll get more out of the presentation. So with that in mind, let's first turn to Luke chapter 22 verses 31 and 32 concerning conversion. The Savior says some interesting things to Peter on this occasion. Verse 31, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Verse 32, But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith faileth not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Now that's interesting. That implies that Simon Peter has not yet been converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He does have a witness, I guess what we would call a testimony, of the divinity of Christ that's been given to him by the Father as he has testified, Thou art the Christ. But there must be a big, or must be a difference between just testimony and conversion, and that Peter is still in need of going through the process of being converted. There is a difference between having a testimony and being converted. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, in a first stake fireside in 1968 gave a talk called Be Converted. I'd like to consider a few things from it as he talks about this process and the difference between t testimony and conversion. And so the following is from Elder McConkie. A testimony is to know by personal revelation from the Holy Spirit that Jesus is the Son of God. The spirit of prophecy is synonymous with the testimony of Jesus. See Revelation 19.10. Peter had had the prophetic spirit resting upon him, and he knew, not by reason, not by argument, not from a theological sense, but by the promptings and whisperings and voice of the spirit, he knew that this man Jesus was literally the Son of God. He was a witness. Peter had a testimony. Peter had worked miracles. He had been in the ministry. Now we come to this occasion when Jesus is going to be tried and in due course crucified. And we discover the Lord saying unto him, in effect, Peter, you have got a testimony of the gospel. You have borne record that I am the Son of God. I have certified to you previously that your testimony was true but ye are not converted. There is a difference, as is evident from this, between having a testimony and being converted. It is only fair and is also essential to the story to say that the reason Peter was not converted in the full sense is that the time had not then arrived when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the people. As long as Jesus was with them, for some reasons that are only partially understood by us, they did not need the full and constant companionship of the Holy Spirit. This came later. It was the promised endowment that they had got on the day of Pentecost. This does not mean that they did not have the Spirit on occasion. We have already shown that they did. They had the Spirit that certified truth to them from time to time. But they did not have the constant companionship. The full sanctifying power had not yet come into their lives. The Holy Ghost does two things in particular. On the one hand, he is a witness to truth. And so he bears the testimony of truth. And that is how we get a testimony, by revelation from the Holy Ghost. But on the other hand, the Holy Spirit is a sanctifier, and he has the power to cleanse and perfect the human soul, to wash evil and iniquity out and to replace it with righteousness. 
And that is the occasion when we are converted. We get a testimony from the Holy Spirit when the member of the Godhead tells us that the work is true. And his great function in that field is to bear testimony of the truth. We are cleansed from sin and are born again and be converted to the truth when we get the constant companionship of that member of the Godhead. That is, get the right to the constant companionship. Nobody actually has the companionship all the time because no one is perfect. No one lives in the ideal and perfect state. We do the best we can and we get sufficient of the companionship to have our sins burnt out of us as though by fire. And that is what is involved when we use the expression, the baptism of fire, meaning the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That is a symbolism to mean that dross and evil are burned out of the human soul as though by fire. And as a consequence, the individual becomes a new creature of the Holy Ghost, as Alma explained. So you become a new creature. There has been a change. There has been a conversion. In the past, you walked after the manner of the world, but now you walk as becometh a saint of God. We may have testimonies without being converted, but all of us ought to be in the process of getting converted, and it is a process. A person may get converted in a moment miraculously. That is what happened to Alma the Younger, but that is not the way it happens with most people. With most people, the conversion is a process, and it goes step by step, degree by degree, level by level, from a lower state to a higher state, from grace to grace, until the time that the individual is wholly turned to the cause of righteousness. Now this means that an individual overcomes one sin today and another sin tomorrow. He perfects his life in one field now and another field later on. And the conversion process goes on until it is complete until we become literally, as the Book of Mormon says, saints and God instead of the natural man. That's Mosiah 3.29. What we are striving to do is to be converted. It is not enough to have a testimony. So conversion is being cleansed from our sins and the desire to sin by the power of the Holy Ghost that goes deep into our heart. It's not just a witness. It's more than just a witness. That's a testimony born by the spirit of revelation. Conversion is when our whole souls become new through the Holy Ghost and we turn our whole lives over to God and Christ. Are we in the process of being converted? Luke chapter 22, 19 through 20, and then 39 through 42. There are two different cups talked about in this chapter that I want to focus on, that I think there's a great principle taught here. First of all, we have this cup. Number one, verse 19 says in Luke 22, And he, meaning Christ, took bread and gave thanks and break it, and gave unto them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Verse 20, Likewise also the cup, after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. And so we know this is the beginning of when he starts the sacrament. The cup of the sacrament, where we renew our covenants and promise in a covenantal relationship to follow after the will of Christ and our Heavenly Father. We drink this cup to get the Savior inside of us and for us to become a part of Him and for Him to become a part of us that we will always remember Him and always keep His commandments. So that is one cup that we can partake of. Number two 
Let's look at verse 39. This is when he goes out into the Mount of Olives. Verse 39, And he, Christ, came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. Verse 40, And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray ye that ye enter not into temptation. Verse 41, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed. 42, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I'm sorry, I misspelled that. So here is the other cup that Christ talks about. The cup that he is asked to drink of the atonement. In Doctrine and Covenants, Section 19, verses 16 through 18, he describes what this cup is like, that he's being asked to be removed if possible, but if not, he is willing to drink. Here's the description of this cup. Verse 16, For behold, I, God, have suffered these things for all, that they might not suffer if they would repent, meaning they may not suffer like him. We suffer down here. It doesn't mean all suffering is taken away. It means if we'll use the gift of repentance, we may not suffer as he suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane. Verse 17, but if they would not repent, they must suffer even as I. Verse 18, which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain and also to bleed at every pore and to suffer both body and spirit, and would that I might not drink the bitter cup and shrink. So the description of this cup is paying the price for sins. And look what it did to a god. It caused him to tremble because of the pain and to bleed at every pore, both body and spirit. Can you imagine what that would do to us if we had to partake of that cup? And so we have an option, brothers and sisters. Which cup will we choose? Will we choose the cup of the sacrament and use it properly to come unto Christ and to do his will and not our will? Or if we do not partake of the cup of the sacrament and use it properly, then we must drink our own bitter cup, even as the Savior did. The choice is up to us. Which cup would you rather partake of? Partaking of the cup of the sacrament and doing it properly and using it week after week to come unto Christ and renew our covenant relationship and only obey Him keeps us from having to drink of the bitter cup that he partook of in the Garden of Gethsemane. John chapter 18. Let's turn to John chapter 18 now, verses 1 through 6, who is in control. There is an interesting thing that happens in these verses. Verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the book Kedron, where was a garden, into which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oftentimes resorted thither with his disciples. Verse 3, Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, come thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Verse 4, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? Verse 5, They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. Verse 6, As soon then as he said unto them, I am he, they all went backward and fell to the ground. Now, isn't that odd? What would cause them to fall down? It's just like they just, they just automatically fall down when he said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you seek. May I suggest 
that the Savior used his priesthood power and he knocked them to the ground. In other words, he show, was showing them who is in control. You will not take me or do anything unto me until I give my consent. Christ willingly lets them take him. He is in complete control. If he could knock them down just with the thoughts of his mind or the sound of his voice, then he certainly could stop all that they were about to do unto him. I think this shows us that the Savior is in complete control. And he will decide when they take him and what will happen. And he willingly submits to what he must now do. John chapter 18, verse 28 through 32 Death by hanged on a tree. Verse 28 says, Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas into the hall of judgment, and it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. The leaders of the Jews felt they went into the Gentile hall that would defile them and make them ritually unclean. Verse 29, Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man, meaning Jesus the Christ? Verse 30, They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Verse 31, Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him, and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. Now there have been occasions, remember the one time when he testified that he was the Christ and they took him to the brow of a cliff and they were about ready to throw him over and to kill him because they thought it was blasphemy because he dared say that he was the Son of God. They weren't too concerned about the death penalty then. And so, may I suggest that the Jews are doing two things here. Verse 32, that the saying might be fulfilled which spake, signifying what death he should die, meaning by crucifixion. One, I think the Jews are trying to leave it up to Pilate to give him the death sentence. So they think that then they're not culpable and that they are innocent then of the deed. They didn't do it. Pilate did it. That's one thing I think that they are trying to do, thinking this was ab absolve them from Christ being crucified. And second, I think they wanted him to hang on a tree because of this. In Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 through 23, it says, And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree. His body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God, that the land be not defiled, which the Lord God giveth thee for inheritance. So there are two ways the Jews carried out the death penalty. One was by stoning to death. We know that was under the law. Another one is by being hung on a tree. Now that one they did if they wanted he let us hang to be accursed of God, meaning being damned. Accursed means being damned by God or being cut off. This was a way to show and to shame the person who's being hung on a tree. It shows their shame. It shows that they're guilty of great shame and sin. May I suggest to you that they wanted the Romans to crucify him on a tree, being hung on a cross, to show the people, look, this man is shamed. How could he be the son of God if he's accursed, if he is hung on a tree? This is to show shame to the people. 
D. Kelly Ogden and Andrew C. Skinner, two Bible scholars of BYU, said, History, unlike art, indicates that crucifixion crosses in the Holy Land were often solidly rooted trees, usually olive trees, with branches trimmed off and crossbar, Latin, patabulum, attached. This is especially the case during the Roman period of Judea's history. And this is exactly the image presented to us by the apostles Paul and Peter, who talked about Jesus being hanged on a tree for our sins. And so I think the Jewish leaders are trying to think that, oh, look, we won't be blamed for it. We didn't send him. We didn't convict him. Pilate did it. And then we can show the people that he was a shameful man. He was accursed of God. He was cut off. This can't be the Son of God, or he would not have been hung upon a tree. So once again, the Jewish leaders trying to denounce his godhood and trying to cover it up by putting the blame on someone else. John chapter 18, verses 33 to 37, to this end was I born. The Savior makes a very important claim to Pilate about who he is and what his mission is. Verse 33, Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Verse 34, Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it of me? Verse 35, Pilate, Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priest have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. I am not just a worldly king. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. If I was just a worldly kingdom and I was a king, then I would fight you with an army. But now is my kingdom not from hence. My kingdom is the kingdom of heaven. And it is from his Father. I have not come at this time to physically destroy the Roman Empire and to fight them physically. This first coming was to battle spiritually, to overcome Satan and death. 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. In other words, just as thou sayest, it is true. But to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world. What you're about to do to me, I let you do to me. This is the whole reason I came here, was to fight and overcome spiritual and temporal death. I am not come to fight physically the Roman Empire and put down the kings of this world and to start the millennial reign. I have come to fight Satan and physical death and to overcome spiritual death so that people may repent. To this end was I born. This is the whole reason I was born. For this time, what you're about to do to me, and I'm going to let you do it to me, because I keep my covenants with my Father. This cause came I into the world. The cause of fighting sin, so that you and I could repent and become righteous. Now, in Abraham 2, 9 through 11, tells us to what end were we born? What were we of the house of Israel sent here to do? And are we taking up that cause, just as Jesus took up his cause? Well, let's read what Abraham 2, 9 through 11 says. Verse 9, And I, 
Jehovah will make of thee, Abraham, a great nation, and I will bless thee above measure, and make thy name great among all nations, and thou shalt be a blessing unto thy seed after thee, that in their hands, the seed of Abraham, they shall bear this ministry and priesthood unto all nations. So one of the reasons the house of Israel was sent to what end the house of Israel was born was to bear the ministry of the priesthood, to take the gospel covenant and priesthood blessings to the earth. Verse 10, And I, Jehovah, will bless them, the seed of Abraham, through thy name. For as many as receive this gospel shall be called after thy name. All those who come into the house of Israel to the waters of baptism, that's how we receive this gospel, are called after the name of Abraham. We are the seed of Abraham. Because it says, And shall be accounted thy seed, and shall rise up and bless thee as their father. Verse 11, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. And in thee, that is in thy priesthood, and in thy seed, that is thy priesthood, for I will give unto thee a promise that this right shall continue in thee, and in thy seed after thee, that is to say, the little seed or the seed of the body, shall all the families of the earth be blessed, even with the blessings of the gospel, which are the blessings of salvation, even to life eternal. So to what end were we, the house of Israel, born to do? We were born to be the seed of Abraham and to take the priesthood and the blessing of the gospel to all the families of the earth. That is to what end we were born. The question is, will we be as faithful as the Savior was to the end he was born? Will we now keep our covenants to the end for which we were born? And that was to bear the ministry of the priesthood, to take the gospel to the families of the earth and bless them with the blessings of salvation and eternal life, which can only be had through the gospel of Jesus Christ and entering into a covenant relationship with him. Well, that's up to us if we will keep our covenants, and do what end we were born to do. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.